uh, uh, last uh, August, August 26th, uh, a ceasefire was reached between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the, uh, that's the most recent of a long series of ceasefires. Uh, so far, the, uh, the terms of the ceasefire were familiar from earlier ones. I'll review the record briefly. And uh, the aftermath so far has also fit the usual pattern. And the pattern is very clear and definite. Uh, almost exceptionalist for the major ceasefires. Uh, Israel ignores the, the terms completely and maintains its repression, its siege, its violence, its uh, criminal activities in the occupied territories, and they are criminal. Uh, Hamas observes the ceasefire, as Israel officially concedes, until some escalation of Israeli violence elicits a Hamas response, which serves as a pretext for another episode of what uh, Israel calls elegantly uh, mowing the lawn, another assault of uh, typically greater violence than the one that preceded. Uh, the American press and commentary then goes into its regular mode deploring what uh, the New York Times a couple of days ago called Hamas's assault on Israel and uh, uh, explaining that uh, Israel has a right to self-defense, uh, asking how we would react if uh, we were being attacked by rockets from Canada, uh, maybe saying that Israel went a little too far in its uh, self-defense activities, but it's fundamentally the victim and justified. And then we move into the next phase of the same pattern over and over again. Uh, this began the first relevant ceasefire agreement. It was in November 2005. I'll read the terms. Uh, it uh, was the agreement on movement and access. Uh, it uh, called for, this is a pretty close paraphrase, it called for a crossing between Gaza and Egypt at the Rafa, at, at Rafa for the export of goods and the transit of people, continuous operation of crossings between Israel and Gaza for the import, export of goods and the transit of people, reduction of obstacles to movement within the West Bank, bus and truck con convoys between the West Bank and Gaza, the building of a seaport in Gaza, and the reopening of the airport in Gaza, which had been destroyed by Israeli attacks. Now, that's essentially the terms of the repeated ceasefires, including this one, slight differences. Now, the timing of the first of these, November 2005, is significant. Now, that was the t moment of uh, uh, Israel's, what they call their disengagement from Gaza. Uh, what happened is that uh, Israel decided to remove several thousand settlers uh, from their subsidized homes illegally in Gaza, where they were protected, where they're taking maybe a third or more of the uh, limited resources of Gaza, protected by a substantial part of the Israeli army, and the Israeli hawks realized that this is pretty ridiculous. Uh, Gaza was already almost devastated by Israeli attacks. It, would, it made more sense to move them from uh, Gaza to subsidized homes in the West Bank, in the Golan Heights, which Israel intends to keep. Uh, this was presented as a noble gesture uh, you know, opening the way to peace, uh, but the awful Palestinians uh, didn't take the opportunity and instead uh, decided all they want to do is kill Jews. So they started sending rockets and building tunnels and so on. That's standard picture. The reality is entirely different. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the goal, the official goal of the so-called disengagement 
was actually described, frankly, by the Israeli official who was in charge of negotiating it with the United States and implementing it, Dov Weissglas, a close associate of uh, Prime, then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. He said the goal of the disengagement, I'm quoting him, is the freezing of the peace process so as to prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state and to ensure that diplomacy has been removed indefinitely from the agenda. Uh, as I said, the Hawks, for the Hawks, it was a rational objective. Uh, the propaganda was different. For those of you who are old enough to remember might recall the, say, the Boston way the Boston Globe depicted it, a uh, big front page picture of a little boy uh, pleading with the soldiers not to tear down his home uh, with a big headline saying, never again, meaning uh, we're never going to allow ourselves to be dispossessed from our land again. Uh, it was, it was a, for the American audience, the main target, it was an effective propaganda agency uh, uh, effort. In Israel, uh, the more sophisticated observers simply ridiculed it. Uh, Baruch Kimmerling, Israel's major sociologist, for example, uh, it dis uh, described it as it was, a PR gesture designed to uh, ensure that there would be support for Israel's illegal colonization of the rest of the occupied territories. Uh, it would have been very easy to remove the settlers with no ado at all. It would simply have been necessary to announce that on such and such a date, the Israeli army will leave Gaza and uh, the settlers then would climb into the lorries that are provided to them and would move from their subsidized illegal settlements in Gaza to their subsidized illegal settlements in the West Bank, but there would be no a PR success from that. It was particularly comical because it was a repeat of what almost to the in detail of what was done in 1982 when Israel was compelled to evacuate the Sinai and uh, they staged the same um, same kind of events. I recall there was a headline in Israel's major newspaper, Haaretz, uh, which said, in Hebrew, said, uh, National Trauma 1982, uh, just uh, ridiculing the show. Uh, this was a repeat. Uh, if you had some, and incidentally, the same could be true if uh, Israel is compelled to remove the illegal settlers from uh, the other occupied territories, it's not a very hard operation. Uh, it's a different story. Well, what actually happened then is, is not this uh, noble effort to, for peace, which the Palestinians refused to accept. What actually happened is described quite accurately by uh, Israel's the two leading scholars in Israel who have uh, written the definitive work on the settlers, uh, Edith Zertal and Akiva Eldar. Akiva Eldar is uh, Israel's leading diplomatic correspondent. Uh, Zertal is a noted historian. Uh, what they say is the ruined territory, Gaza, was not released for even a single day from Israel's military grip or from the price of the occupation that the inhabitants pay every day. Uh, after the disengagement, Israel left behind scorched earth, devastated services, and people with neither a present nor a future. The settlements were destroyed, the Israeli settlements were destroyed in an ungenerous move by an unenlightened occupier, which in fact continues to control the territory and kill and harass its inhabitants by means of its formidable military might. And that's Israel's two leading scholars, authors of the major work on the occupation. Actually, it has an English translation now. It's called Lords of the Land, worth reading. Uh, and Israel is still the occupying power. That's recognized, I think, by the world. As far as I know, by every country, including the United States, uh, apart from Israel, of course, which rejects it. It's the occupying power in every reasonable respect. Well, that was the first, November 2005. Uh, that ceasefire lasted a couple of weeks. 
In January 2006, a few weeks later, uh, Palestinians committed a pretty serious crime and were punished for it and are continuing to be punished for it. There was a free election in Palestine, actually the only free election in the Arab world. Uh, it uh, closely monitored, uh, uh, declared to be free and fair, but it came out the wrong way. The United States is strongly in favor of democracy when it comes out the right way. When it comes out the wrong way, we destroy it. That's our, remember that this was right in the middle of passionate orations about democracy promotion and so on. It came out the wrong way. Uh, Hamas won the control of the parliament. Now that's not supposed to be the result of a free election. Uh, Israel and the United States instantly reacted by imposing a much harsher siege by other penalties. Uh, European Union, to its shame, trailed along behind the master as it usually does. Uh, and uh, that was the end of the ceasefire that uh, es escalated. The Israeli attacks continued by, by June of that year, uh, about 7,700 Israeli uh, shells, um, high, high explosive shells had attacked Gaza, uh, part of the general attack. And of course the siege was extended. All the terms of the ceasefire that I mentioned were completely abandoned. Uh, I, mention, I say June because in June the attack escalated much more harshly. And so it continued until the next ceasefire, uh, which was in June 2008, in pretty much the same terms. Israel was to end the siege, allow, allow export and import, uh, essentially the terms I just uh, read uh, before from the November 2005 one. Uh, the pattern repeated. Israel immediately announced that it was going to ignore the terms of the ceasefire, maintain the siege, maintain violence, and so on. Hamas observed the ceasefire. Uh, Israel officially acknowledges that until November 4th, 2008, the day of the U.S. presidential election when attention was focused on that event. On that day, Israel in, Israeli forces invaded Gaza, uh, escalated, and uh, killed half a dozen Hamas militants. Now, that led to, uh, to custom rockets, this kind of primitive rockets, they're called rockets. Uh, Israel responded. Uh, that went on for a couple of weeks, uh, lots of deaths, all Palestinian. In late December, Hamas offered to renew the ceasefire on the original terms, in fact, terms even more favorable to Israel. Uh, the Israeli cabinet considered it. This was what's called a dovish cabinet under Ehud Omer. They considered the offer uh, and decided to reject it and instead launched the next episode of mowing the lawn, that was Operation Cast Lead. That was a murderous and brutal operation. There's very good literature on it. Uh, in uh, January, uh, uh, President Obama was interesting, interested at the, interesting at that time. He had been elected on November 4th, but he hadn't yet been inaugurated. And he was asked a number of times to to comment on the massacre, I mean, the massacres were pretty well reported, uh, with the usual twist. I mean, Israel's under assault, but they were reported. And he was asked if he could comment on it. He said he couldn't. That the United States has only one president, namely Bush, and therefore he can't comment. Uh, he was commenting on everything else, but couldn't comment <laughs> on this. Actually, he made one comment, uh, the usual one. He said, "If my daughters." were under attack by rockets. I would do anything possible to stop it. He wasn't referring to the children in Gaza who were being torn to shreds and slaughtered, uh, but to uh, children in the Israeli settlement of Sterot, uh, who are under occasional custom rocket attack. Uh, the assault was very carefully planned, cast lead. It, of course, Israel totally controlled it. There's no, no defense. Uh, they terminated the assault a few hours before Obama's inauguration. Uh, so therefore, he didn't have to comment on it because it was over. 
And when he was asked to comment, he said, well, we shouldn't look at the past, we should look forward to the future. That's a standard line of major criminals. Uh, forget the past, it's over, let's look forward to a glorious future. If any of you are planning a career as uh, in the mafia or in the diplomatic service, which is about the same thing, it's a good lesson to remember. Uh, so therefore, Obama didn't have to say anything about it that time. Well, in, right in the middle of the attack, January, January 8th, 2009, uh, the UN Security Council passed a unanimous resolution, the US abstaining, called for an immediate ceasefire and then added the usual terms, pretty much the ones I quoted. Uh, they were never observed. Uh, it all broke down completely with the next major episode of mowing the lawn. That was November 2012. Uh, just to illustrate what was going on, you take a look at the casualty figures for that year, which are typical. Uh, there were 78 Palestinians killed, one Israeli. Uh, Israel was under assault. Then came a ceasefire uh, uh, with the usual terms, the familiar ones. Uh, the uh, out aftermath of that was uh, described pretty accurately by a prominent scholar, Nathan Thrall. He's the Middle East specialist for the International Crisis Group. What he says is that Israel recognized right away that Hamas was observing the terms of the ceasefire and it therefore saw little incentive in doing the same. In other words, it ignored the terms. The military attacks on Gaza increased along with more stringent restrictions on imports. Exports were blocked. Exit permits were blocked. Uh, that continued for 18 months until April 2014 uh, when uh, Gaza, Hamas based in Gaza, and the Palestinian Authority based in the West Bank uh, uh, made an agreement for a unity government, signed a unity agreement. Uh, Israel was infuriated and they became even angrier when not only the world endorsed it, but even the United States kind of tepidly endorsed it. Uh, there had to be a reaction to block that. That's quite important. I should say there's a good reason why Israel, with U.S. backing, has blocked uh, integration of Gaza and the West Bank for 20 years. Uh, that's ever since an agreement was signed called the Oslo Agreement, which declared that the West Bank and Gaza are a single territorial entity and cannot be separated. Uh, ever since then, the United States and Israel have been dedicated to separating them. There's a very good reason for that. Uh, it's rarely discussed, but if you look at a map and think for a minute, you can see it. Uh, if uh, Gaza and the West Bank are separated, any kind of limited autonomy that ever might be granted in the West Bank is essentially imprisoned, has no access to the outside world. Any access would be through Gaza. So if you break the two apart and you keep Gaza kind of totally devastated under siege, anything that happens in the West Bank is more or less meaningless. It's uh, surrounded, completely surrounded by Israel on one side and uh, the Jordanian dictatorships, close ally of Israel on the other side, very anti-Palestinian. Uh, so that's, uh, th there is a good reason to keep them separated. And that's one of the reasons why Israel was extremely angry at the unity agreement, which could be a step towards uh, uh, integrating the two as required by the, uh, the sacred uh, text of the Oslo agreement, which the US and Israel were um, signed with the usual cynicism. Uh, it, another problem from Israel's point of view was that one of the pretexts for uh, avoiding serious negotiations was that it's impossible to negotiate with the Palestinians because who do you negotiate with? They're not unified. There's two groups. There's Hamas, which unfortunately won the election, and the Palestinian Authority, which we support. Well, once they're unified, that goes. So that's another reason for the fury. Uh, in any event, it was pretty clear that Israel had to respond pretty quickly 
and it did. It launched a major assault on Palestinians in the West Bank, also in Gaza, primarily aimed at Hamas, jailed hundreds of people, killed a lot of people, and so on. Uh, finally, that did elicit a response from Hamas a couple of days after lots of killings in Gaza, and that led to the latest episode of mowing the lawn, protective edge. Uh, all the way through, I should say that Israel did have a pretext. You have to have a pretext for everything. Now, the pretext for the assault was the murder of three uh, Jewish uh, settlers, uh, teenage, uh, teenagers who were murdered in the West Bank quite brutally. Uh, Israel claimed that they didn't know whether they were alive or dead. It turned out to be false. They knew right away that they were dead. Uh, but it gave uh, a pretext for several weeks of uh, intensive, uh, uh, you know, uh, pretended efforts to search for them, uh, combined with extensive repression. Israel also, and of course, at once Israel announced, uh, Netanyahu and others, that they knew for certain that this was carried out by Hamas. Actually, it turns out they knew right away that it was probably carried out by a. Uh, a cell in uh, Hebron from the Kawasme clan, which uh, has loose connections with Hamas, but has been a thorn in Hamas's side for years. They don't follow orders. And that was pointed out right away by Shlomi Eldar, one of their, uh, Shlomi Drury, their one of their leading specialists on Hamas. But the, uh, the act worked very well for the intended American audience, and uh, it looked as if there was a pretext for the uh, operation. Well, that's uh, up to the present. Uh, the pattern is very clear. Uh, it's hard to miss. It takes uh, considerable uh, genius, maybe, for the media and commentators to miss it. Uh, don't take my word for it. You can look at the record. It's all available. And this is essentially what it is. Uh, so far, in the few weeks since the latest ceasefire, it's been pretty much the same. Uh, the siege remains. Israel has very slightly relaxed it. And there's a report this morning from a very good uh, Palestinian journalist, Mohammed Omer, a personal friend actually, who lives in Gaza, has been reporting from there for years. And he says that Israel has allowed a small shipment of sweet potatoes to leave Gaza. So far, that's about it. Uh, they haven't allowed uh, pr products from Gaza to go to the West Bank, which is the natural market. And they used to have a market in Europe for flowers, vegetables, and so on that, that's barely allowed. There are a few other relaxations. Uh, Israel, he points out, no longer prevents import into Gaza of uh, shoelaces, uh, ketchup, and uh, I think candy is the third, which they used to block, so that's now allowed. Uh, otherwise, things work pretty much the same way. Uh, there is a possibility, which has been discussed by some reasonable observers inside Israel, that this time Israel might be willing to stop, or at least re relent a little, in the steady torture of Gaza, which has actually been going on since 1948. But, uh, intensively in the period I described. Uh, the reasons are several. Uh, one reason is that uh, uh, Egypt is now in the hands of a very vicious dictatorship, one of the darkest periods in Egypt's history. And that's very beneficial for Israel. They're very happy about that. Uh, for one thing, they like dictatorships in the Arab world. Democracies are dangerous. And this dictatorship happens to be very anti-Palestinian and particularly opposed to Hamas. So it's a decent ally for Israel. So that means that on all sides, uh, Palestinians are kind of contained. That's one reason. A second reason is that uh, Israel's uh, actions in the West Bank, which go on steadily right through this period, in fact, right after the August 26th uh, ceasefire, Israel announced the biggest land grab in decades in the West Bank in the Jerusalem area, anything that goes on in the Jerusalem area. And notice that all of this is in strict violation of international law. There is no question about that. 
It's repeatedly condemned by the Security Council, including the United States. Uh, World Court has ruled that it's all in violation of the Geneva Conventions. That's with the agreement of the U.S. Justice. He didn't vote. He didn't join the majority, he wrote a separate opinion, but he agreed that, uh, yes, all of the settlement is in is de facto violation of the Geneva Conventions, which uh, prevent, block the transfer of population to an occupied territory. And there's no doubt, nobody except Israel refuses to call this occupied territories. Uh, so it's all illegal, and Jerusalem it's multiply illegal because there are separate resolutions going back to 1968, which the U.S. also signed, uh, it, ordering that Israel should uh, uh, terminate any actions that change the character of Jerusalem, where most of the building and development is going on. Uh, anyway, these illegal activities have now reached a point where the Israeli government might consider that uh, they're just too far gone to reverse, so therefore it's less important to uh, separate uh, Gaza from the West Bank and to torture Gaza. Now, the third reason, which Israel has discussed, is the uh, turmoil that's going, in in the, going on in the Arab world, which is very good from Israel's point of view. They like to see Arabs killing each other. And uh, it, uh, as they point out, it's uh, created new alliances. So there has been a kind of a tacit alliance between Israel and Saudi Arabia, the main U.S. ally, because that's where all the oil is, uh, going back to the formation of the state of Saudi Arabia, kind of family dictatorship. Uh, that's, uh, the alliance has been kind of tacit, now it's a little bit more overt. And uh, with this new collection of alliances and the focus on uh, the Islamic State and jihadism and so on, Israel may feel that it has in a better position to uh, put an end to the torture of Gaza, or at least relent slightly. Uh, that's a possibility. So far, there's no indication of it. Uh, as I said, the pattern is being uh, pursued uh, just as it's been for years, including the U.S. description. Well, uh, what about the prospects? Uh, if you look at the debate over this in the uh, in diplomatic circles, uh, commentators, scholars, uh, activists, uh, almost universally, uh, the, there are two alternatives counterposed. One alternative is the two-state settlement that has been an international consensus for 35, 40 years. Uh, we're not allowed to talk here about history, remember, that's irrelevant because it doesn't look good. But if you look at it, the two-state settlement was proposed for the first time in January 1976 in a resolution brought to the Security Council by three Arab states, three major Arab states, uh, Egypt, Jordan, and uh, Syria. Uh, they called for a settlement on the internationally recognized border uh, uh, with uh, guarantees for the right of each state to exist, quoting it, to exist in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. That's January 1976. Uh, the, Israel refused to attend the session. Uh, maybe coincidentally, it uh, bombed Lebanon without any pretext, killing 50 people, but that's just normal. Uh, it uh, may have been a response to the United Nations. Uh, the United States vetoed the resolution. Uh, when the United States vetoes a resolution, and remember the U.S. is the champion of vetoes by far since the U.N. sort of fell out of control in the 1960s with decolonization. Uh, when the U.S. vetoes a resolution, it's, of course, doesn't, it's not implemented, but it's also vetoed from history. So you're going to have to look pretty far to find the record of this. It's there. Actually, you can even find it in the New York Times the day it was passed. But it's kind of out of history. You can try and search and see if you can find it. Same thing happened in 1980. U.S. Carter, the United States vetoed a similar resolution. Uh, 
uh, matters in the international arena shifted to the General Assembly where there are regular votes, uh, you know, 150 to 2 or in U.S. Israel, sometimes Marshall Islands or something like that. Uh, the, the most recent veto, February 2011, actually did receive a little attention. They're usually ignored. Uh, Obama, that's Obama's veto, February 2011. The uh, Security Council was voting on a resolution to implement Obama's official policy. He vetoed it. The official, that did raise a few eyebrows. Now, the official U.S. policy, which is words, not, me, not meant. The official U.S. policy is that Israel should uh, end its expansion of settlements. That's the big issue that's discussed. Actually, the expansion of settlements is a pretty marginal question. The question is the settlements, not expansion. They're all illegal to start with. But the Security Council did vote on uh, uh, expansion of settlements, and Obama vetoed it. Uh, Susan Rice, the UN ambassador, gave an eloquent explanation of why we had to veto our own policy, but uh, you can look at that and figure it out. Uh, that one, as I say, did receive a little attention. Uh, what's actually been going on is that for, and meanwhile, the United States provides the military, uh, economic, uh, diplomatic support that is necessary for Israel to carry out all its actions and also the ideological support by the way the issue is framed. It doesn't sell very well in the rest of the world, but it sells here. Now, the way the issue is framed is, as I described, uh, Israel's the victim, uh, we have to has a right of self-defense, and so on. Of course, there's a, there's a particle of truth in that. Uh, Israel does have the right of self-defense, but it doesn't follow that it has the right of self-defense by force. There's a qualification to the right of self-defense. You have the right of self-defense by force if you have exhausted peaceful means. When you've rejected peaceful means, you've refused even to try them, you don't have any right of self-defense at all. You don't have a right to shoot a pistol across the border. Now that's evident. The same would be true if uh, we were, if it were imaginable, to take the usual analogy of, uh, uh, say, Canada was uh, uh, sending Qasem rockets at uh, New York or something. Uh, we would have a right to respond by force if we had exhausted peaceful means, not if we had rejected peaceful means, not if we'd followed the pattern that I just described. So the right to self-defense is just, it may, doesn't arise. Uh, well, the standard description is uh, either a two-state settlement, which is incidentally supported by essentially the entire world, uh, the Arab states, uh, the Organization of Islamic States, which includes Iran, um, Europe, at least theoretically, uh, Latin America, and so on. Uh, Israel rejects it. The United States blocks it. Those are the two rejectionist powers. It's essentially why it doesn't get implemented. Uh, that's one alternative. It's very common now to say that Israeli uh, occupation of the West Bank, and nobody talks about it, but the Golan Heights has proceeded far enough so that it can't be reversed. And that leads to the second alternative. And the second alternative, which is widely discussed, is that there will be a single state. Israel will simply take over the entire area from the Jordan River to the sea, former Palestine, and there'll be a single state and many Palestinians uh, uh, support that outcome. Uh, they argue that then the, there can be a civil rights struggle and anti-apartheid struggle modeled on South Africa uh, within this single state. Uh, Israelis are, don't, except for the extreme right, uh, Israelis are opposed to that because it poses a problem, a problem which is called the demographic problem. The demographic problem is too many non-Jews in a democratic Jewish state. A democratic Jewish state is kind of an oxymoron, but you can play with that if you like. But if there's too many Arabs, it will really be a problem. Uh, so that many, uh, especially liberal uh, Israelis, are kind of opposed to this alternative. And that's the, those are the choices that are counterposed. Those are the prospects that are laid out. All of this is wrong. It's missing the obvious. Think about it for a minute. 
Israel has a much better alternative, and the U.S. backing it as well. The better alternative is simply to continue doing exactly what they're doing. And we know what that is. You can read it, observe it, and what Israel is doing with U.S. support, endless U.S. support, is first of all taking over the what's called Jerusalem, which is an invention. It's about five times the size of anything that ever was Jerusalem. It takes in all sorts of Arab villages and regions around it. It'll take over Greater Jerusalem, big piece of the West Bank. It'll take over, uh, there are corridors that are being constructed to the east. There's a major corridor east of Jerusalem that goes to incorporate a big town, Mal el Dumim, which was built mostly during the Clinton years uh, with the purpose of essentially bisecting the West Bank. You take a look at the map, its lands reach to Jericho, just about, which essentially bisects the West Bank. Uh, there's two other corridors in the north cutting through, one to the town of Ariel, another town of Kadumim, a couple of others. Uh, Israel takes those over that uh, kind of cantonizes what's left. If you look at the map, it looks as if there's a substantial area that Israel isn't taking over, but that's mostly uninhabitable desert. They're taking over what they want, what's useful. Uh, Israel's taking over the Jordan Valley quietly, step by step. They've now reduced the population, the Arab population there from, it was 300,000 in 1967, now it's maybe 60,000. Usual procedure, the army moves in, uh, uh, announces uh, that there's a military area, all the settlements have to leave, uh, or maybe there's a green area which is not allowed to be settled. The Palestinians are kicked out. If they're Bedouins, they're just tossed into the desert. Uh, After a while, it turns out that a military settlement is being built, it's really a military settlement, and it's replaced by an actual settlement uh, they sink wells all over and you know, slowly develop. But this is a policy, for those of you who know the history of Zionism, this has been going on for a century. Uh, the policy is uh, what's called uh, dunam, with a, like a quarter of an acre. The dunam after dunam, uh, sheep after sheep. In other words, do things quietly so the goyim don't notice it. But gradually, you get more and more. And when it gets established, it's accepted. That's how the state was built. That's the policy that's being pursued now. With the support, the crucial support of the United States, you can't claim not to see it. Uh, Israel will also take over everything that's uh, on the Israeli side of uh, what's called the separation wall. It's a wall which about 85% of it cuts through Palestinian territory. It was declared illegal by the World Court, it certainly is. Uh, it uh, is presented as defense against terrorism, but that doesn't pass the laugh test. Uh, it's protection for the settlers who are inside the, the, uh, uh, the wall. I mean, if Israel wanted to defend itself against terrorism, it would build a wall on the border. They could make it a mile high, you know, tanks up and back each side, uh, atom bombs, anything it wanted, and there wouldn't be a whisper of protest in the international community. Now, that would be defense. But this has nothing to do with defense. It has to do with taking over arable land, uh, uh, resources, a lot of water resources there, and uh, the nice suburbs of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and so on. Uh, taking over the Jordan Valley, incidentally, means about a third of the arable land in the West Bank. And of course, it completes the imprisonment completely. Take a look at the map. It's not just Jordan, but also the West Bank. Uh, The Jordan Valley will be under Israeli control, occupation ultimately. That does leave some Palestinian cantons. And in typical neo-colonial fashion, uh, Israel wants to establish a few places in the West Bank for the Palestinian elites, the rich Palestinians, the educated Palestinians, so they can have a nice place, kind of like any third world country. They go to the poorest third world country you can imagine. There are people who live in luxury that is unimaginable to us. 
you know, that's, that's the neocolonial pattern. And that's Ramallah, maybe a new city that's being built in a nice theater as restaurants, so you live like in London and so on. Uh, that's the pattern that's being established. There is absolutely no reason, and, if you, if you, and, if, and those are the areas that Israel intends to integrate into Israel. Well, they have very few Palestinians. Now, those who are there are being mostly kicked out anyway. So at the end of this process of integrating these areas into Israel, there won't be any demographic problem. In fact, if you look at the numbers, it'll actually increase the ratio of Jews in greater Israel, because they'll bring in half a million settlers and scattered numbers of Arabs. So no demographic problem, no problem with a democratic Jewish state. Uh, Palestinians will be left in isolated cantons. They can have some kind of autonomy if they want. Uh, actually, what they can have was described graphically by the first Israeli prime minister to countenance the possibility of a Jewish state. That actually is Benjamin Netanyahu, who was considered the ultra hawk. Uh, the Labour Party uh, prime ministers like uh, Shimon Peres, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, never considered the possibility of a Jew Palestinian state. They're strongly opposed. And when Netanyahu came in in 1996, uh, his uh, ministers were asked, could there be a Palestinian state? And they answered that, yes, we're going to leave something to the Palestinians. Now, they can call it a state if they want, or they can call it fried chicken. Uh, that's essentially the goal. So there'll be some fried chicken left to scattered Palestinians in the West Bank, a nice town in Ramallah where they can live like Westerners. Uh, Gaza <coughs> kept under siege, illegally of course, and uh, uh, devastated. Uh, uh, there's no reason for Israel to go move towards one state. Why should they? They have a much better solution. Now that's the likely prospect. And as long as the United States supports it, uh, there's every reason to expect this steady, regular process to continue. And that really puts it in our hands. Uh, any significant change in this process is going to have to come from here, and it can come from organized activism of the kind that has uh, changed policy in other cases, sometimes even harder ones. Uh, and it can in this case, too. If it doesn't, I think these are the very likely prospects. Thanks.